Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Holgan. I'm an HPC Applications Engineer uh, with ARM. I was originally working with Alinea, providing uh, support and training for the uh, Forge tools. Um, how, many of you in, how many of you in here are already or have, have already used like Alinea Forge, either MAP or DDT? So the agenda for my talk today is uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start off going over some general debugging and uh, profiling advice. Uh, then I'll go into um, the ARM software uh, solutions that we have for, for debugging and profiling, uh, specifically debugging with DDT and profiling with MAP. And at um, the end of the slides, I'll go over some theta-specific settings to, to help you get started. Uh, so when it comes to debugging, um, it's really about transforming your broken code into something that works. Um, and the way you can do that is to, to follow these um, six techniques uh, with the an acronym TRAFFIC. Uh, one, uh, track the problem. Um, it, it's always helpful to, um, to, to write down what it is that you're doing if you, if you ever encounter a problem in your code. Um, chances are you, you might, might run into that same problem again in the future. And the last thing you want to do is um, have to debug an old um, problem when you already knew that you fixed it before but just can't remember uh, what you did. Um, so it's always helpful to, to find some way to log it. Um, whether it's in a notebook or some type of, uh, some type of tracking system. In addition to tracking, you want to you be able to reproduce the problem. Um, you know, try to uh, uh, get it into as, as small of a problem, problem as possible. Um, that, that way, it's, it, you want to, to eliminate as many um, variables that, that could, be, um, um, could be the issue. And if you can, you know, you, you would like to automate this process, you know, um, kind of, kind of like do a unit test right, to make sure that uh, once you once you fix it, you want to make sure that this this problem doesn't pop up ever again, and you don't have to worry about it. So, you know, take the time to do it once, uh, set up set up an automated test, and um, and just let it go in the future, so that you know you don't you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, you know, and and the, and the other initials, you know, you want to find it and. and Try to uh, focus on to focus on you know where this problem is coming from. Um, sometimes you know bugs you know they're they're not easy to find. Um, you can spend spend days or weeks uh, just trying to figure out what what's going on. Uh, one thing you can do because you can you can do what's called uh, rubber duck debugging. Is, is anybody in here familiar with a uh, rubber duck debugging? Okay, cool. Uh, so the the idea behind that is that you. Uh, you want to talk through um, talk through the problem, whether it's with somebody um, who, who's a non-expert or you know just just somebody else. Um, you might want to go through the code line by line and just oftentimes in, in going through the procedure of trying to explain what the code is supposed to be doing, um, you, you'll find out uh, oh hey there, there's a mistake somewhere or where did that minus sign come from? That's not supposed to be there. Um, so that's one of the things you can do. Um, but a, lo a lot of this is going to take some time. And there's no real perfect procedure for debugging and getting all the bugs of your code. Um, but tools are here to help you, uh, whether it's using DDT or if it's using TotalView or just the GNU debugger, um, you know, to, to help you save time and figure out how to fix your code. So on the other side of debugging, um, now that you've you fixed your code, you, you want to make sure that it actually um, uh, gives you the answer in, in, in a reasonable amount of time. You want to get the most performance out of your code. Um, you can see here that we've got a little uh, kind of like a flow chart of things that you might want to identify when you're profiling your code. Um, at the top, you know, we've got the, the file I.O. where you might want to focus on um, the buffers, the data formats, and memory file systems. And you, you go through the communication, memory, and CPU. Um, so, so one thing you want to kind of try and keep in mind is that, uh, for instance, in communication, if there's some type of load imbalance, it doesn't matter how well vectorized your code is um, if you know, cores are just waiting for other people to finish their jobs. Um, so that's why we have a, a communication listed above uh, CPU um, profiling. Uh, but that's not to say that profiling or vectorization is not important, because yeah, it, it is. It's just that the impact of the others could be greater if you're not aware of them. 
Uh, so this is kind of a workflow that you can go through uh, when you're starting to profile your code. You always want to work with a realistic test case. Uh, you don't want to, you really don't want to profile a toy program that has behavior that's, uh, that does not mimic what you plan to be running on a, on a production basis. So you know, start with a realistic test case. Uh, profile your code. Uh, run it with the, perform, uh, with the profiler. And the box, uh, look for the significant. Um, you know, what that means is uh, which part phase of the code, you know, dominates the time? You know, is there an unexpected significant time being spent somewhere? Um, and from there, you might, you might identify some of these problems, whether it's like problems of the file, I.O., communication, memory, or CPU. Um, in, in which case, you know, you, you might want to stop, stop and ask yourself, you know, what can I do to, uh, to overcome these bottlenecks? And then lastly, you know, think of the future. You know, you know, try. Um, you might want to try a larger process or thread counts uh, to see if there are any scalability problems. You know, you know, just because it performs well for one set of circumstances, it may not perform well uh, once you start scaling it up. Okay, so ARM has uh, some software um, to, to help you with uh, debugging and profiling. Um, by, by acquiring Alinea software, um, they got access to our tools, uh, ARM Forge. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty standard in most of the top 500 um, machines out there in the world. Um, yeah, it's it's not, not only available for x86, it's also useful for IBM Power uh, if you're working on NVIDIA GPUs. And of course, it, it, it works on ARM hardware. Um, and it, it's, it's fully scalable. So whether you're, you're, you're doing work on your laptop uh, in a serial code, or you're doing it using 100,000 cores or uh, 500,000 cores, you know, all the way, um, the way to use the tool is the same. And you should expect this uh, similar uh, uh, performance uh, when using our tools. If you haven't used it before, it, it's very, very user friendly. Um, it's got a nice graphical interface, and uh, I'll, I'll go through some examples uh, later today. And the other tool that we have, in addition to um, DDT and MAP, is called uh, Performance Reports. Uh, Performance Reports gives you a nice uh, high level overview of how, how, how your program is running on your system. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you, you, you might take your code, you, you've got it, you know, you, you know it works great on your little, little cluster, or, well, not, well, on your cluster at your uh, university. Uh, but when you go to transfer it over to a different system, which may have like different hardware, um, newer generations of CPUs, or, and so on and such forth, um, it's often possible that um, you can squeeze out a little bit more performance just by tweaking parameters in the code. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in, in a future slide. OK. Um, so with DDT, um, if, if you know that you've got some bugs, uh, DDT is a, a very handy tool to use. Uh, we've got the feature called offline debugging, where um, if, you're, if you know you have a bug in your code and uh, you're trying to get on the m machine, you know, sometimes you, you can't just get on you can't get a uh, allocation right away. Uh, you might have to wait. Um, so we offer this nice, cool feature called offline debugging, so that whenever your job um, eventually starts or goes through the queue, um, DDT will run it in the background. And if there's some type of crash, it'll gather uh, information about uh, what, what's happened, what, what's happened to your code uh, during that crash. It'll give you a nice little stack backtrace, and you can. Uh, look at the HTML view um, of all the output um, whenever you get a chance. OK. So I was saying earlier, um, you might want to check to see um, how your code works with uh, performance reports, you, you know, uh, especially if you're running it on a new system. Um, here it gives you a nice little HTML report uh, that's, that's very easy to read. Uh, the green here tells you how much, how, what, presented, what percentage of the time is being spent in computation. 
uh, how much is spent in MPI communication. And in the orange, we have a percentage of uh, the IO. Um, I, you, you can't can't read it on the screen, but it's, it's, it's saying here that um, since there's such a, a low cost of, M, of time being spent in MPI, you might be able to increase the number of MPI ranks um, on, 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 the, on the node that you're running on. Okay. And also, um, clearly, at the bottom here in the CPU, it, I know it's hard to read, uh, but it, it's also showing you exactly uh, how, how many of the vector uh, operations uh, have happened within your code. And if that's a small, small percentage, you might want to go back to your compiler and you know, generate a vector report and get a better understanding of why something did not vectorize. Do these, these suggestions always apply? Do, do these the section suggestions always apply? Yeah. Um, most of the time. Yeah, most of the time, it's good advice. Um, but, but just, just because you follow the suggestion doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get um, a massive speed up. Yeah, but it, it, it's still up to you to identify um, what's going on. Yeah. It, it's not going to fix the code for you if, if that's what you're trying to get at. <laughs> OK. Uh, so if you looked at the high level perf report, um, uh, the report, and you, you realize, you know, hey, there, there's some room for improvement, you might want to go dig a little bit deeper um, with our profiler. And so you can identify uh, which, which, uh, which lines of source code are taking the most time. And you might want to focus on that area. OK. OK, so at this point, I'll, I'll switch focus, um, um, primarily talking about DDT, uh, our debugger. Uh, so, so once you know that you've got a problem, um, you, you, you can uh, run it with our, with our, with our, with our debugger. And uh, there, there are a few questions that you might want to ask yourself. Uh, like, who had a rogue behavior? Uh, where did it happen? How did it happen? Why did it happen? So th these are all kind of questions that you, you have to try and figure out uh, through the use of the tool. And uh, DDT has several features to help uh, make Make gathering this type of informa information um, pretty simple. So in, in the bottom right here, what you see um, is a, uh, a, a collapsed stacked view. So you, you, you can't tell um, from, from this image. But, but what, what it's trying to show you is that, uh, I guess you can't see my mouse. Uh, there are over 150,000 processes. Um, so all of them are at one line, 30300 of communicate.f90. And then you've got one process, one process uh, at line 303. Um, so by, by merging all of these stacks together, it's often pretty clear to spot outliers in your code. Um, so if, if everyone except for one is at um, a certain line of code, and this one is at a different line of code, uh, odds are likely that one, that one process in the, is in the wrong place. And you've got to figure out you know, how did it get there and um, what effect does this have on your code. OK, and, and above that, what we have are what's called spark lines. Um, so we have two variables, uh, jcall and mype. And in, in, in this example, mype is supposed to represent the uh, MPI rank uh, for each of all, for each of the processes, and as you can you can see, it's it's got this strange pattern, and it's kind of kind of random. Um, for, for those of you who have worked with MPI, um, you, you should know that my rank should just go from zero to the number of ranks minus one. So clearly, there's a bug in the code. Uh, this is actually a, a screenshot of a pre-production MPI library uh, where they were trying to figure out what was wrong. And by using uh, DDT, they were able to see right away um, that the number, uh, that the, the my rank uh, value was, was clearly incorrect. On the other hand, we have jcall, uh, which um, is, is just a, a, a loop counter, uh, or loop index. And, and that, that, does, that has like a, a, kind of like a random pattern, you know, it's, it's, it's like a dense block, uh, 
uh, hovering around 36. Um, and that's actually OK for that type of thing. Um, if, if you know it's not supposed to have a certain pattern, then you can just, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's what it would look like if you, if you weren't expecting it to have a, a pattern. OK, so how do, you, how do you use your code with DDT? Uh, well, the first thing you want to do is you want to recompile it with a dash G to get the debug symbols in your code. And uh, we recommend that you turn off the optimization flags, um, typically with dash O0. Um, if you fail to do that or you forget to, sometimes uh, the compiler will optimize out variables. Um, and that kind of makes it a little difficult to debug because, uh, you, you know, yeah, yeah, they don't actually exist when you go to run it. OK. So if you have a psych fault, um, and, and you can see here we have an application that crashes you know, outside of DDT, uh, what happens when you run it under DDT? OK. Well, if you load it up into DDT, into DDT it's going to say, hey, um, you, you've, got, you've got a crash at this line, and it's going to tell you why, why it crashed. In this particular instance, it says the reason is the address is not mapped to an object. Um, so we're, we're actually trying to access something um, that's uh, out of bounds. And you can clearly see this when, when you're in, in, their, in our graphical user interface, just by hovering um, over the array at the line where the crash occurred. Uh, so, so by hovering over this tab, tab array, we can see that it's an integer array, uh, and it's got um, elements from 0 to 12. And uh, we're trying to access x and y. And on the right there, we can see that while y is 0, x is this ungodly huge number, which is clearly out of the bounds. Um, OK, so that's a. Uh, that's uh, one of the use, feature, uh, uh, use cases of, of, of DDT. OK. So sometimes you might encounter a bug um, where your, your program runs, it runs, and then sometimes it doesn't run. Um, you know, it, it works well most of the time. And you, that, that typically is a sign that you've got some type of memory bug somewhere. Um, with DDT, uh, you, can, you can turn on uh, advanced memory debugging uh, by linking some special libraries to your code. Okay, and you would do that through the run dialog. You just simply tick uh, the memory debugging. And then from there, you can, uh, you can adjust some sliders for, for heat debugging, depending on uh, what type of checks you want to uh, apply to your code. And you can also turn on some guard pages. Um, for, for the heap debugging, um, so, so what these sliders mean, fast, balanced, thorough, and custom, uh, they actually turn on uh, several different checks. Uh, so for instance, fast is just your, your basic checks. Um, you know, and, and as you go to the right, you, you, you uh, enable more and more checks. But you, you pay the penalty of uh, performance, because um, it has to do all these additional checks. Okay. Um, so uh, another feature that comes with uh, memory debugging are, are what's called guard pages, um, sometimes also referred to as electric fences. Um, the, the, the idea is that um, if you have an array and if you uh, put these guard pages around these allocations, you can actually detect whenever an illegal access uh, has gone beyond the allocation. Um, so, so yeah, this is this is uh, very useful when trying to uh, when when you have like this type of issue where it works and it doesn't work sometimes. Um, but you got to keep in mind also, you know, as soon as you turn these guard pages on, I, uh, you, there's uh, there's a memory overhead cost by doing so. Um, so if you are if you're already pushing the limits of um, your code in terms of memory usage, you might want to scale the problem size down a little bit before uh, turning on guard pages to uh, do some memory debugging. Oh, yes, sorry. 
So I was wondering how it works with deadlocks, where it doesn't crash really, but then it just hangs at some some weird process count or something like that. Uh, are you able to look at the back the backtrace of all the processes when when it actually hangs and kind of com do a comparison of some sort? Okay, so if it's hanging. So it's stuck at a line of code somewhere. So you can you can pause all of the processes and you can take take a look about take it, you can investigate where is everybody located. Okay, you can see the backtrace at that point in time. Yes. Okay. Yes. So one of the biggest competitors actually um, to our tools is, is not another vendor, but actually just using print statements. Um, you know, I mean. It seems pretty straightforward, right? You know, you, you, you got a problem, oh, hey, let me just spit out the value. Um, unfortunately, that is not a scalable procedure. Uh, as you get into 100,000 of cores, there's, there's just so many lines of output you have to sift through. And uh, if you're just doing it to standard out, they may be all jumbled if they're all trying to write to, to standard out stream at the same time. Um, one problem that DDT was used to solve uh, happened at a very large scale. Um, so I don't know if you can see this. So this is over, it's over 17,000 17, uh, MPI ranks. And they were running. And they noticed that, hey, my code is crashing in this libpar menace routine. Uh, what's going on? Well, they ran it through DDT. Uh, they see that it happens at this line here. It looks pretty simple, right? You're just, you're just uh, taking a value out of one array and sticking it into another array. No, nothing, nothing weird happening there. Uh, but when they went to go look at the values um, that, are, that, are, that are trying to access for all picks, they see that the value was optimized out. Uh, well, that's why we recommend running at dash O0. Because uh, now you have to recompile your code and get back to the same point. Because you can't tell what happened because the value is not the, the variable is not even there. OK. All right, so once you do that, um, they can see, oh, hey, everything looks, looks fine. Uh, NT samples is 180, uh, what, what, 1 million something. OK. Why, why, why is this going out of range? Does anybody have an idea about why this is crashing? Just be before I reveal it? So we're just taking these two, two integers. We're multiplying them, or we're, we're, we're dividing. But uh, we had some issues with Parmas recently. I think it was the number of people that the difference in size. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So what actually happened is we had an integer overflow. Um, when you do i times nt samples, we now have a negative index when we're trying to access the array, and that's why it's crashing. Anybody have an idea of how to fix this? No int. Yeah. Instead of using regular ints, use a different, uh, a lot like a long int. Yeah. Very, very good. So, so, so here you can see that um, um, that the what they did was they they evaluated this expression. So this expression, uh, while it was part of um, the array index, we were just interested in the numerator. And we found out that i times nt samples actually became a negative number. OK, uh, another feature with DDT is that you know sometimes um, when you're checking out code, a lot of times the new bugs appear from the latest changes. Um, so one thing you can do is if you're using some type of version control system, which I hope that everyone in here is doing, um, you want to track down you know, what, what, is the, what, what is the latest change and then try and figure out uh, whether or not maybe that's, th that's what's causing um, the new bug. OK, uh, speaking of changes, um, at, you know, as programmers, if we have a bug, we, we really think that we can solve it within a couple hours. Um, but oftentimes, that, that's really not the case. Sometimes you, know, you might need to spend a couple days or, or even weeks or maybe the rest of your college career. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it, in which case, the so DDT helps you track your changes in a logbook. So everything that you've done uh, through DDT, yeah, we have what's called this logbook tab, um, whether you stepped over processes, looked at certain variables, and you can save it. 
uh, and then uh, c compare it at a later date or come back to it. Um, so this is, this is kind of like the, the tracking, tracking feature that I mentioned before. That um, yeah, If you know that you're going to be working a while on, on some type of bug, you might want to track your changes from day to day. Okay. Um, DDT isn't, doesn't always have to be used for spotting bugs. Uh, we had a customer uh, recently ask, um, so, th so they were working on some intrinsic code for the KNLs, and they wanted to know, how can I be sure that the AVX registers are being used? Um, well, if you're in DDT, you can actually disassemble the code, uh, look at the assembly that's uh, associated with the line of code, and you can even look at uh, the registers directly in the evaluation window. And here I'm just looking at the ZMM18 register. And, and notice that it has different representations, whether you want the float, double, integer, um, you know, for, for the various different registers. So this is kind of advanced, but if this is something that you might end up working on, you know, it's good to know that uh, DDT is capable of disassembling the code and looking through the, uh, the various registers, whether it's the ZMM, YMM, or the XMM registers. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna switch on over to uh, going through a quick uh, demonstration of using DDT. Yep, I've got an uh, interactive uh, job already on Theta, so let me uh, make sure I can see some color. All right, so. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay. So here I have a, an application that if I only use four ranks, it's going to run fine, if it runs. Yeah, there it goes. OK. Uh, but as soon as I increase the number of ranks to eight, it should crash. OK, segmentation should fall. All right, so now the question is, you know, how, how, do, I, how do I deal with this with DDT? Um, so on my local machine, I have installed the local client of Forge. Um, I've configured a remote launch for Theta, where it's simply just your username at theta.alcf, you know, that gov. Uh, I've got the path here to soft debuggers, the Forge 18.2.1 for today's installation. Um, so I've already done this. And so the reason you'd want to use the remote client or the remote launch is so that you don't have to do all the X11 graphics transfer, transfer over the network. Okay, uh, so to get uh, Forge working in Theta, so I'm just going to do module load uh, Forge 18.2.1. And to get it with DDT, I just take my, my natural AP run command and just stick DDT dash dash connect in front of it. So don't just say module load Forge, you'll get the wrong one. Yes, you have to specifically ask for it, uh, 18.2.1. Otherwise, you're going to get an older version, uh, version 6. OK. And what happens is when I, when I, when I put dash dash connect, I, I have a reverse connect connection. So Theta is trying to communicate with my local client. So I just say accept. OK, so I get this run dialog. And here's where you can turn on memory debugging if you want to. But for, for this particular example, it's not necessary. So I'm just going to click on Run. So typically, when you launch DDT on your code, it's going to break at MPI init or main if it's a serial program. Uh, this one actually breaks into uh, a, dar a Darshan function because the Darshan module is loaded. Um, so that's one thing to note that if you're going to profile with map, you have to unload the module Darshan because uh, we cannot work with uh, things that wrap MPI calls. Um, but so to go back to our actual code, we can go up the stack tree. Uh, so what called the Darshan function is simply MPI init. 
Um, okay, so if we hit play, it's going to take us to our crash. Uh, notice that only uh, processes 4, 6, and 7 are crashed uh, because they have turned red. Uh, 0 through 3 and 5 are actually still running. Um, it's just kind of a, a random nature here. So I'm going to hit pause. It's going to pause 4, 6, and 7, but the rest of them are still running. Uh, in order to get everything to stop, I can say pause, and it's going to apply to all, um, all of the processes in the current group, which is everything. OK, so if you can't remember what the, the error message was that DDT showed you, you can always, like I said, go back to that logbook. It says, you know, address not mapped to object. And, and it put us on the line where this happened. Um, so just like I showed in the presentation, um, the, the tables array, this, in this case, it's C. Uh, so it's a, it's, got, uh, it's a 12 by 12 array, and it's trying to um, access a value of y of 9,995. OK, so it turns out that this is really poorly coded. So instead of a while loop, we should actually use a for loop to loop over the y variable. So I can quickly modify that within DDT so I don't have to actually exit out of the program. And I don't need that to increment since I'm doing it through the for loop. OK. Uh, so we've edited the, the code in place, so we just save the source file. Now we can actually build uh, within DDT. So we wanted to configure build first, uh, make sure that we're in the right directory. So, C starting PI. OK. And then the command here is just simply clean it and then rebuild it with make. So now that we've set the build configuration, just click on build. OK. All right. It's done. Now we can just restart, restart the session so that it goes back to the beginning. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask you all to take it on faith that I did actually fix the code. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to show some other features here. Uh, OK, so what we can also do is we can set a breakpoint after this array is initialized. So I just right click on the left side, left side here and just say add breakpoint for all. Um, so that's going to apply to all the processes. Uh, in addition, um, there's this variable called being watched. What I can simply do. If I'm interested in knowing how a variable changes throughout the code, I can just add a watch point. OK, and I'll put that there. OK, uh, so let's play. OK, so all, of, all, all, all eight ranks reached the break point, so now this is no longer a problem. Um, what, what's kind of cool in uh, DDT is that you can actually um, view the array simply by just right clicking on, on, on the array name, view array, and then evaluate. Um, so this is the numerical uh, representation of the array for rank 1. If I wanted to switch between the ranks, I just simply uh, select up here, uh, go back to my array viewer, and reevaluate. OK, that's, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, but now, what if I wanted to know the first row of this array? Um, so I just, instead of $i, which was filled in automatically, uh, I just hard code it to zero, so I'm just looking at the first row of the array. Now, if I wanted to know what the first row for each of the processes are, I simply increase the distributed dimensions. So now you can see that P goes from zero to seven, so these are all my eight ranks. So uh, what I'm looking at is the first row of this array across all of the various ranks. And this is a pretty handy little feature. I mean, consequently, you can also do the first column. Um, OK. Um, so let's, the next thing I wanted to go back to talk about was watch points. So we have a watch point on our variable. So every time this variable is changed, no matter where it is in the code, a DDT will prompt you and say, hey, this variable has changed. OK. So if I can hit continue. And it, not only it'll tell you uh, where it's changed, it also specify exactly which processes um, have, have uh, changed it. Because it's not always going to be applied to everything. OK. Um, and, if you, and if you're tired of being annoyed by this watch point, always 
um, triggering. You can always uh, turn it off by just going to the watch point tab and turning it off. Um, additionally, what I can do is uh, I can take this variable here and I can say, um, let, let me add a trace point to it. Oh, actually, I already have it there because I did this earlier. Um, so what that does, instead of the watch point where it always prompts you whenever <coughs> the value changes, uh, the trace point was go will go on its merry little way and just record it. And y this whole QSTAT permission denying, I think that's, that's an artifact of having the Excel module loaded on Theta. Uh, th you can really ignore that. Play, continue. All right, done. All right. In which case, you can see the trace point output. Every time it changed, it, it keeps a nice little lock. OK. Um, back to the presentation. Current slide. All right, so that's DDT. Uh, so these are other things that you can try with DDT. You can, like I said, I showed you how to stop and variable change. Uh, there's also static analysis warning. Um, like for instance, say you, uh, you declared a variable, but you forgot to initialize it, uh, and you never actually use it. Um, it'll, it'll warn you on the side there. And we also have uh, additional um, memory debugging features if you wanted to get more information about your code. Uh, so this is like a little a little cheat sheet of how to use DDT. So this is all on on the web in case uh, you ever forget on how to how to do it. Okay, I'll, I'll quickly go over Map since I'm running over time here. Uh, Map is our profiler. It's uh, nice and lightweight. Um, the, the idea is that we're not trying to slow down your code when you run your code uh, through Map. Uh, it's 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 pretty easy to see what's going on. Left to right. Left is when your code starts. Right is when your code finishes. Um, you can identify imbalances immediately, uh, like the blue sawtooth pattern. That means there's some type of uh, load imbalance where um, MPI ranks are waiting for one another to finish. Okay. And then we had a, a nice little test case of Cloverfield uh, where there's some I.O. going on. And it actually took up about 8.6% of the time. Um, th and you can see uh, through uh, the disk write transfer that it only maxed out at 14 megabytes per second. Um, one way to improve on this is to actually use HDF5. Uh, in doing so, it, the, the throughput went up to uh, 75 megabytes per second. And it, it had a pretty good impact on the runtime as well. Uh, okay, so, so things you can do with map, you can find the peak memory usage, find imbalances, remove bottlenecks. Uh, make sure OpenMP regions make sense. Um, sometimes you might have a, a section of code where open, OpenMP is, uh, is taking place, and you're actually doing a lot of synchronization where, when it actually might be faster to turn off uh, OpenMP there. OK. And these are just uh, uh, data-specific settings on how to uh, run it on theta. OK. With that, any questions on the tools? Yes. Um, so if I have a very rare race condition, what I would like to be able to do with a debugger is sort of just run it through the debugger, check the output. Um, I'm assuming there's no error. It's just like the numerical results are wrong, maybe. I'd like to check the output, see if the race condition occurred. If not, rerun it. And eventually, when the error did occur, I want to be able to use the debugger to actually like see what happened with the processes going in the same order ranks going in the same order. Is something like that possible with DDT? I don't think so. But, yes? I, I can tell you how to do that. There's a tool called Pinplay. Intel's Pinplay tool will rerun execution, or will run an execution and keep, uh, keep track of the interleaving. And then you can run it overnight repeatedly, and when it crashes or satisfies your predicate, then look at it. All right, thank you. Any other questions?